Thank you very much. Yes, uh, my name is Jared Overson. Uh, I'm going to be talking about credential stuffing, and you are just the most beautiful audience in the world because I don't actually need to talk all that much about what credential stuffing is. Uh, I do have to do that at almost every conference, but here is just going to be one single slide just to make sure that we align to the baseline. Uh, credential stuffing is, of course, the replay of breach passwords against other sites to see uh, who has reused accounts. Uh, and you might look at that and immediately wonder, what the hell is there to evolve? It's pretty basic. What else does, it, does this uh, uh, amount to? Um, but first off, who am I and why should you trust me? Uh, my name is Jared Overson, I'm Director of Engineering at Shape Security. Uh, Shape Security uh, is a US company founded by the guy who coined the term credential stuffing. Uh, about 10 years ago, coined it at the Department of Defense uh, when he saw a bunch of attacks and was like, hey, this looks like a problem that should be solved. Uh, he was my boss for a while, I built the prototype for the current uh, enterprise defense at Shape and led the team to develop it. Uh, I'm a Google, Google developer expert, which just means I know a lot about web stuff, uh, and I'm an old school video game hacker, so if you ever played with StarCraft or Fallout or Total Annihilation back in the day, you might have been using my tools, uh, and I bring that up because uh, that's, that's a kind of an important adversarial relationship that is very, very similar to the stuff that we have to do with credential stuffers nowadays. Uh, you can find me at JS Overson just about everywhere. Uh, if you want more stuff about JavaScript, attack tools, credential stuffing, some video games, uh, and of course American politics, because whoa. <laughs> so we're going to be going over why credential stuffing is evolving in the first place, uh, and then how it's evolving, and then what is next on the horizon. Credential stuffing is evolving for the same reason that anything evolves. Uh, there is incentive and there is adversity. Something is in the way of credential stuffers and there is incentive to move past those blocks. If there was nothing blocking a credential stuffer, there would be no incentive to evolve. They would just stay at the same level. And if it wasn't valuable enough, they wouldn't bother evolving. Uh, now this, uh, Pierre Antoine talked a little bit about the increasing the cost uh, for attackers yesterday. And this is an important point for all sorts of attacks. It's very, very important for attacks that are going through an open door like a login portal or anything like that. Because uh, when you have no defenses, you have a cost of essentially nothing. And it might not actually be nothing, but it's the baseline. Nothing can get lower than that, and it's very, very low cost. As you add any sort of defense, a CAPTCHA, fingerprinting, whatever else, you increase the cost by forcing a generational shift for attackers. Uh, those who want to play the game have to pay that cost, and then they keep on going. The goal here is to add enough defenses so that the cost versus value tips in your favor. The problem with this, though, is that once you get to this point, you feel pretty good. Uh, but as we've seen with mobile computing, computing in general, storage, AI, cloud, literally any technology, is just by doing nothing, the cost of entry to those generations decreases over time. As things become more generalized, optimized for common use cases, anything, just the cost goes down. Now, the reason all of us exist at our companies right now is strictly to increase value at those companies. So what we have here is a dynam dynamic that is pulling in exactly the opposite direction that we would want it to be in order to protect ourselves and our users. So with any attack, there is always some split between manual work and automated work. There is no attack where you can just walk up blindfolded, smash a button, and have millions of dollars pouring all over you, uh, because as soon as there was an attack that easy, it would be blocked, and there would be something that would add cost to it. So manual work is the stuff that you will do and can do if the value is high enough. If the value decreases, you have to figure out a way to, to manage that cost, and you turn towards automation. The same conversations and the same things we're doing in business all over the place is the same thing that's happening in the attacker ecosystem. Automation scales as long as the cost is low. If we adjust the cost or value on either sides, we just change the balance and uh, attacks will adapt one way or the other. So credential stuffing, to make sure that everyone understands the cost of credential stuffing, is a simple four-step process. You could probably, most of you, get started relatively easily tonight, uh, but just to make sure that we know how cheap it actually is, we're going to go through it. 
So the first step is to get credentials. This used to be somewhat difficult. You had to know the right people or, or find the right crowd or breach the, breach the credentials yourself. Now you can just go to a site like raidforums.com, uh, click on the collections one through five link, read the blog post or, or whatever it's talking about, uh, and then download literally billions upon billions of credentials for eight credits down at the bottom. Eight credits on Raid Forums at the time I took this uh, video was about $2.50 USD, uh, which is not an insurmountable cost. Uh, but also, this was just hiding a torrent link. So there were plenty other forum posts that had that torrent link. So you can get these credit credentials for literally nothing. Now, there are a ton of credentials, uh, and you're not going to type those in by hand, of course. Uh, so you need to automate that. And you automate that with any number of tools that exist out there. This is Browser Automation Studio, which is an automation framework on top of uh, production Chrome that uses a Blockly or Scratch-like interface to drag and drop logic. So you don't really need to know how to code. You just drag and drop these blocks, fill in some input values, click some buttons on the page, and it records all this for you and then replays it in an actual Chrome browser. Now, if you are so inclined, uh, you could program this yourself or drag and drop this yourself, uh, but time is money, and we're talking about cost versus value, so you might as well just find somebody to do it for you. You can go to a site like Upwork.com and look for people who will configure these tools for you for relatively cheap. This used to be also difficult. You had to go to those dark web forums or those spooky, weird places with the black backgrounds, and you had to find somebody who will make the configuration for you. Now you just put in your credit card in a legit legitimate site, uh, and you can pay somebody to configure this for you for 10 bucks an hour. I would guess that a lot of common sites without defenses uh, probably take about three to five hours to configure, so you're looking at about 30 to $50 to get a tool like Browser Automation Studio up and running. Next step is to defeat whatever defenses exist, and there is inevitably something that will exist in your way because this problem has been around for a while. This is, of course, uh, Google's reCAPTCHA version 2, uh, which has been around for quite a while. They're on version 3, uh, which is actually less CAPTCHA-like than any of the other CAPTCHAs they've done. It's similar, does similar things, but doesn't actually block anyone anymore. It gives you the, the information to figure it out yourself. Version one was the squiggly letters. Uh, this is version two. Gives you the green check mark if you're okay. If you're not, you have to compete against Google's own machines to determine whether or who knows the most about what's a crosswalk or what's a street sign or something like that. Um, and I mean, the irony is not lost on me that you are literally competing against a computer to prove that you are not a computer. But now, the, the problem with defenses like these is that uh, they are cheap and everybody uses them. Now, if you were an attacker or a burglar, uh, and you were presented with two neighborhoods, one with a 1,000 unique locks that were all really, really good, and one neighborhood with a 1,000 houses that all used the same exact lock, which lock would you target first? Obviously, the lock that got you a 1,000 houses. So you get these CAPTCHA solvers that exist online, uh, which allow you to automatically bypass these CAPTCHAs. This is a death by CAPTCHA, there's two CAPTCHA, X CAPTCHA, whatever else. You can actually just Google CAPTCHA solvers, find whichever one suits your fancy, and go there. You don't need to be some sort of crazy black hat hacker, again, going to dark websites and figuring this out. You just Google how to bypass Google stuff. Uh, this is $1.39 for uh, 1,000 solved CAPTCHAs or 99 cents if you're a gold member. So if you really are invested in this, you might as well up your level and get a little bit of a discount. So that's 1,000 solved CAPTCHAs, not even CAPTCHA attempts. So the, the, the burden of a CAPTCHA does add some cost, but really not that much. Second, uh, the, the last step is to distribute globally. Uh, and this is because of one of the early defenses that we had in place, IP rate limit. If you're issuing 3 billion requests from a single IP address, you'd be smacked down. So you have to distribute around the world in order to make it look like you are actually a distribution of normal human beings. This also used to be costly. You needed to find your own botnet, create your own botnet, uh, find your own proxies, pay for your proxies. Now you've got Azure, Google Cloud, uh, AWS. Uh, all sorts of, of uh, global cloud services that allow you to run your code all throughout the world for virtually nothing. You get the first million invocations on Google Cloud Functions for free. And even if that's not enough, uh, you can uh, proxy through there, and, and I'll get through some of the creative ways attackers are proxying in just a minute. So the cost of an attack uh, for 100,000 account takeover attempts can be tried for less than $200, uh, 200 US dollars. 
So that's uh, zero dollars for a ton of credentials. Um, uh, zero to fifty dollars, depending on what you're trying to do with the tool configuration. Uh, one hundred thirty-nine dollars for one hundred thousand soft captures. You could use one of the local uh, captcha solvers, which has a lower success rate. Uh, but in situations like that, if you have a fifty percent success rate, you just double the amount of traffic, and you're good enough. Traffic and requests are cheap. Uh, and then between zero and 10 bucks for 1,000 uh, global IP addresses, which will get you b below a lot of rate limits as long as you do it over a long enough period of time. So that's less than uh, two-tenths of a United States penny per account takeover attempt. So that's our cost. It's low. Our cost means nothing without uh, some assessment of value. Now, the value of these accounts uh, varies dramatically. What I've seen is that many accounts generally sell between a couple US dollars and 150 US dollars. Uh, the cheaper ones are smaller forums, video game sites with not so many uh, video game accounts that don't have many uh, valuable skins, things like that. Uh, the higher uh, dollar accounts are for accounts that allow you to transfer loyalty points or actual dollars because those help facilitate money laundering. But it's a big, big range. And, uh, I know we had a number earlier that was about 30% success rate for WordPress logins. Uh, I have here 0.2 and 2% success rate with what we've seen. Uh, at Shape, we uh, generally protect a lot of the Fortune 500, a lot of the US, so just wildly different types of, of businesses. We deal with a lot of banks, uh, which I'm hoping people take a little bit better care of than their WordPress accounts. Uh, so it's a very, very big range, uh, but I, I'm sticking with 0.2 uh, and 2% for my numbers. Uh, and then the cost we have there. So we get a rate of return, if you smash that into any generic rate of return function, of between 100% and 150,000%. So you are looking at a very, very good rate of return at the worst case. If you have good credentials uh, and, and you have a very, very valuable site, you are looking at uh, retirement money with very, very little money down. So this is where a lot of the fuel is coming for with this iteration and this evolution with credential stuffing. Very long. So now, how is it actually evolving? So this has been a problem for a very, very long time. And I'm going to talk about it some places where we've started as, as an industry um, and then move on to some of the more modern things. Now at the start, remember I was talking about uh, the, the cost versus value, uh, incentive versus adversity. Uh, at the start, there's nothing blocking you, so a lot of early attacks were just curl and wget. Uh, there was nothing that forced you to do anything different. This was quick, it was everywhere, it was very, very easy to do this. Uh, and basic HTTP requests, uh, or these attacks, ended up being uh, very, very popular and started to gain ground very quickly, so you had tools like Sentry MBA, which optimized for this attack case uh, and just issued straight HTTP requests. Um, this really wasn't doing anything fancy at the start. It was automating the ingestion of combo lists, uh, going through proxies, things like that. Um, but it was very, very specifically an attack tool. You wouldn't be using this to, uh, uh, automating, uh, to do automated testing on your website or anything like that. Um, then the uh, natural defense for early attacks was IP rate limiting we went over. Uh, the, def or the iteration from attackers past that point was rotating through proxies. Now, I mentioned about uh, uh, finding proxies, global um, cloud providers, and the first thought that you would have if you were in this defense scenario is just block all of AWS or Google or whatever else because your real users aren't coming from those, serv or those ASNs, so you don't need to actually worry about them. Attackers, of course, know this, uh, and then start using things like the Luminati network in order to proxy their traffic through residential home networks, the same networks like yours and mine. Um, because if your home network has a lot of legitimate traffic coming through it, and I proxy my tra attack traffic through it, uh, it's much more dangerous for any company to block it because you're a legitimate user and we don't like false positives. That's, that's bad, bad for business, bad for brand. So uh, why would anyone allow a service like this to run on their home network? Uh, it's because of services like this, Ola VPN. Ola VPN is a free VPN service that you can install on any of your devices or PCs or whatever that just simply allows it, you to make it look like your traffic is coming from somewhere else. 
Now it's free, doesn't even encrypt your traffic, so as a VPN, it's not even entirely useful. Uh, why would somebody do this? Uh, does anyone like Harry Potter? You should, all of you, come on. The, yeah, everyone should be raising their hand, that is art. Uh, Harry Potter, for those of you who don't know, is not available on Netflix in the United States, uh, but it's available in Australia. So if I can make it look like I'm logging in through Australia, then I get access to all of the Harry Potter catalog for my family and me to watch with popcorn at night. So because this is free, and because I can immediately expand all streaming catalogs that I'm already paying for just by making it look like I'm coming in from somewhere else, I can install this and have access to all these uh, new titles. Now, of course, because it's free, they're making money somewhere. When your PCs or devices are idle, it turns into a proxy for the Illuminati network, and that's where all these nodes in the proxy network are coming from. So this you should actually bring home and make sure it's not running on your network because it is popular uh, with spouses who are home all day, kids, teenagers. Uh, you need to make sure that you're auditing your home network for stuff like this, otherwise you are going to be an unwitting uh, contributor to a proxy network uh, like Luminati. So a defense uh, for traffic like this, text-based captures, uh, we've seen these before. Uh, the iteration for attackers were, was to just use uh, either capture-solving uh, services or OCR as optical character recognition became better. The defense against that was to uh, just make sites more dynamic. Uh, this was a natural uh, evolution of the web over the course of the early to mid-20-teens. Uh, sites just had a lot more JavaScript, uh, and then that enabled a lot more JavaScript-heavy defenses, like ReCAPTCHA version 2, which forced attackers to use actual web views, something that in could interpret web technology uh, and do something with it. So you saw a lot of attacks with PhantomJS and TrifleJS, basically just a web view with a scripting layer on top of it. Now, the defense against uh, tools like these, I mean, you could certainly query some aspect of the runtime environment with JavaScript, but you could also identify these relatively easily by inspecting the header order and other aspects of the network metadata. You can see in Phantom down below, uh, the host header comes at the very end, while with Chrome, the host header always comes at the first spot. Simple things but that's sometimes all you need, especially if you're just detecting stuff. If you're blocking on those header orders, you're giving the attackers incentive to move on, but if you're just detecting, it's a very, very effective way to detect. Now we're getting into more of the modern era over the course of the past four years or so. Uh, attackers uh, quickly identified the problems with PhantomJS, and PhantomJS and TrifleJS just naturally became less effective because they weren't keeping up to date uh, as much as with other browsers. So you found attackers moving to things like Selenium or uh, now Puppeteer to automate production browsers like, like Chrome uh, or Firefox or any Chromium-based browser. Uh, and that, incur or that uh, is continually allowing the attackers to look more and more like legitimate traffic. Defense against stuff like this uh, is very, very common defense, not very effective at all, but is browser fingerprinting. Uh, it's essentially a reapplication of ad tracking technology towards bot defense. So the same stuff that, uh, allo that allows a company to track you searching for, for cat adoption on one site to sell you kitty litter on another site. Uh, those were repurposed to uh, basically fingerprint the source of traffic so that you could rate limit that. Basically the same kind of concepts as IP rate limiting, except you're using uh, browser level metadata instead of network level metadata. Uh, the defense against that was uh, in place very, very rapidly because of the precedent set by ad trackers, uh, and you got randomization of fingerprintable data points. This is FraudFox, uh, which markets itself as the ultimate in internet privacy, um, but calls itself FraudFox, so... Um, it is a virtual machine-based solution to beat browser fingerprinting. So it's also uh, all wrapped up in a virtual machine, so once you get it configured, you deploy it to whatever virtualization service you are invested in, and you are ready to scale right away. Defense at that point is to start looking for negative characteristics in the actual behavior of the page being interacted with. When, uh, again, uh, adversity incentive, there's no incentive for attackers to do anything out of the ordinary until you start blocking it. So when you start to automate a page, you just use whatever natural functions exist in order to interact with the page. 
Uh, you type in usernames in a millisecond. Uh, you, you always click in the upper left-hand corner because why not? So when you see a bunch of interactions with uh, user elements, uh, always clicking at zero, zero, and smashing in a whole bunch of text very, very quickly, it's easy to see that as not human uh, and easily blockable. And of course, you're, if, you're, if you're following with me here, you see where this is going. The natural def uh, the iteration for attackers from that point is to start emulating human behavior. This is using Browser Automation Studio, uh, and you see here, this is just idle human behavior it's emulating right now. First of all, it is going to each element smoothly with some jitter that randomizes every run, but you can also program in idle human behavior that can just have some random clicks, pauses, scrolls, whatever else, uh, just to make it very, very difficult to identify it as being bot-like. It doesn't necessarily need to be perfectly human, but it has to be close enough that you can't block on it without blocking a bunch of legitimate humans. Defense there, browser consistency checks. Uh, so as you're collecting a lot of information from the browser, attackers have to lie a lot in order to make it look like they're coming from a whole bunch of different browsers and environments. They have to lie saying that they're coming from Mac when they're on a Windows machine. They have to lie saying they're from, they're from Firefox when they're running Chrome so that it doesn't look like it's coming from a bunch of single machines. So all those lies add up. Real users might lie a little bit, but not all that much. So when you start to test these things, uh, like basically if you say that you, are, you have an NVIDIA graphics card, you'd better be able to do NVIDIA graphics card-like things. And then you capture all this data, and then a sucker start, this is a legitimate looking uh, number of lies. Then attackers start providing fingerprintable data points from actual devices. So they collect all the things that people are collecting and then uh, present those in tools that rotate through legitimate uh, pools of data so they can provide legitimate data to what's collecting uh, in order to continually make it look like they're a legitimate device. So there are certainly more tactics here, but instead of spending more time on that, uh, we can just jump to the end. The direction all this is moving in is clear. Attackers are continually pushing past defenses and trying to blend in as perfectly as possible with our legitimate users. We're calling those imitation attacks, and I know there's probably a groan somewhere, it's like some new stupid term made by a stupid company, um, but the, it, was, it felt important for us to differentiate this because a lot of credential stuffing and automation attacks gets lumped in as just dumb bots or automation, which uh, trivializes the complexity and the sophistication of these attackers. So an imitation attack is something that we are describing as, as a sophisticated attack from a dedicated adversary that is trying explicitly to blend in with your user's traffic. Not just generic users, but also specifically a specific customer's traffic. So where do we go from here? So the value in our accounts is not going away. Uh, I mean, it, it was actually uh, would be ideal if it was reduced a little bit, because that would certainly help the problem, but unfortunately, shareholders don't like stuff like that. Um, it's actually, GDPR and regulation like that does actually go a fair way, because it forces companies to only collect what they need to collect, so they're not uh, overly inflating or artificially inflating the value of these accounts by just not having more data than they need. Uh, but regardless, uh, companies like Shape, um, companies like uh, Kindred is doing it internally, uh, companies like Google are doing better, Akamai. Nevertheless, we are all increasing the cost of these attacks. Uh, they're still happening, certainly, uh, but the cost is greater. That's not as uh, attractive for any new attacker. So we're seeing a diversification of attacks. Genesis is one of the uh, more recent uh, instances of crimeware that I've seen uh, that takes a different route into accounts. So Genesis is a, a piece of crimeware uh, made in Russia, and it resides on a uh, infected computer and then scrapes session cookies, account details, user passwords, environment data, all this stuff, and then uploads it to a central marketplace. Uh, when I took this picture several months ago, uh, there were over 120,000 bots in this network. Each of these bots advertise what they've found on the marketplace, uh, so you can look specifically for something that uh, has the information you're looking for, or you can just find the one that has uh, the most data and go from there. 
it stays resident on the device and continually updates its entry in the marketplace with new data that is found. You can get a lot of information as to where the accounts are located, uh, uh, what type of environment they're running on, and the important part here is that the cost you pay is for unique and privileged sole access to that bot. So if I buy you, I'm the only one who has access to the bot that is on your machine. So that leaves me responsible for making sure that I don't scare you too much uh, so that I can continue getting money out of you or I just do whatever I want to do with, with your information. Um, this is also a very, very interesting tactic that uh, prevents the data from being devalued too quickly. This is a bot detail page. Uh, you can find this one has uh, 484 individual resources. Uh, things like Facebook, Netflix, Google, Amazon, TD Bank, eBay, PayPal, UPS, Dropbox. Uh, this whole slew of accounts. And then if I buy that for, I think it was uh, $52 or something like that, I get access to all of it. And it's all mine, and I can do whatever I want with it. I can take money out of it, or I can take things like Facebook, all your pictures, and then uh, hold them hostage and say that I'm going to post them online unless you give me three Bitcoin or whatever the going rate of your data is. What you can also do here is generate a fingerprint based off the data that the uh, bot has collected. This is so that you can, uh, as an attacker, bypass a lot of risk-based assessments, which we heard a lot about yesterday um, from a couple talks. Uh, Mads, I think you also uh, had a good demo as to when risk-based scores tip over and present you with things like multi-factor authentication. This allows you to uh, gather the data that you want, load it into the Genesis security plugin, and then be your victim. Now, with a VPN, you can get an IP that's close enough, and then you skirt past a lot of risk-based countermeasures. And this is one of the biggest problems with uh, defending against automated attacks that are going through our open doors, the doors that we can't close, uh, is because these, uh, any defense that we add is friction. And if you talk to our product development teams and, and anyone else, friction is poison. We don't want to add excess friction to our user flows because then users leave. So what we do is we isolate some defenses, the better defenses, around risky portions of our application or when they're logging in from different areas. And what attackers, of course, are doing now is figuring out how to specifically bypass those, uh, those risky areas so they can skirt past. So where, where I see this going, and this is, this is uh, strictly my prediction of, of where things will go in the future, only because I'm a developer and I know how easy it would be, uh, given the, the foundation that we already have here, uh, is using these tools to also learn the actual human behavior of the, uh, the victim whose device you're on, so that you can generate very realistic clicks, uh, keyboard entries, mouse movements, uh, touches, whatever else, to further reduce uh, any sort of risk tip overs. Uh, and then of course, proxying through those bots uh, so you don't even need to use a VPN. You can just generate all the information you need, go through their device, do whatever you need, and there is no risk scoring mechanism that is going to tip over at that case. You look like you, you're coming from your device at a time where you probably would come with the same session cookies and the same browser you're already using. Uh, I would be uh, very, very surprised to find anything that would easily find that to be anomalous. So if there's one th or three things that I can leave you with. Uh, it's a human problem, not a technical problem, which means that there's going to be no silver bullet uh, because silver bullets don't exist against humans, except literally silver bullets. Those exist against humans, but that's a different problem. Uh, Credential stuffing is very often overlooked. I know that you are probably the crowd, crowd that uh, is least likely to overlook this as a problem, uh, but when I tell people in security uh, conferences that I focus on credential stuffing, I get looked at like some sort of lame fool that just kind of they pet my head and walk on, uh, and then when they learn that I love JavaScript as well, then I am just looked like an idiot, and I, no, one, no one trusts me from that point. Um, but Credential stuffing is, or advanced credential stuffing, is sophisticated fraud. And many of our fraud teams in our companies are not at all suited to deal with problems of this caliber.
Um, they often are dealing with downstream fraud and then following back up to figure out where it occurred or how they can flag it earlier. This is fast acting fraud that they are not equipped to handle. Uh, imitation attacks, they're specifically designed to blend in. And uh, it sucks. Uh, it sounds snake oily when you're talking to somebody. It's like, you have a problem. And you're like, no, I don't. Uh, because if, you're not, if you don't know what to look at, it's very, very difficult to even identify that a problem exists. Um, I've got a bunch of solutions, a lot of free stuff. If you're interested, you can ask me questions afterwards. You can at least throw something on your site to see if something exists. Uh, and then finally, all of these attacks are economically driven. The value in our accounts and companies is not going away. Attackers will not stop. Every defense thrown in their way is going to fail because there is just so much value there. So it's, it's on our companies and teams to make sure that they are able to be much more agile and can adapt much more quickly in order to make sure that they can reduce damage as much as possible as quickly as possible. And that is what I've got. Thank you.